How's it going everybody? You know who it is. My name is Sun Wu and in today's video we are going to take a deep dive look at the OP1's Dr. Wave synthesizer. And as always we are going to do this by going through each single parameter one by one. Let's start with the blue parameter. As you can see when you click this parameter it says wave right here. But that's only half of the story because yes this parameter changes the waveform but this also changes the sample rate of the waveform later on. But let's have a look at it. First of all, when we are at zero, we have a sawtooth wave. If we keep turning it, we'll turn this into a square wave. And then when we turn it further, it turns into a triangle wave. And now if we keep turning this knob, it will cycle through the same waveforms again. So sawtooth, square wave, triangle. But after a while, it will start introducing sample rate reduction, which as I mentioned, is basically like pixelating your waveform. So you will see it adds little squares on top of these diagonal lines and therefore introduces some more harmonics. It sounds a little bit grainy and distorted. So let's go through that. Again, we're gonna go to the sawtooth first. And now it turns into the square wave. And you can already hear some of this distortion. And now again, triangle. And as you can see, it gets very pixelated and digital sounding. Now we are at the sawtooth again, which you can almost not recognize because now the sample rate reduction is at its fullest. And if we keep turning it, the sample rate reduction will slowly go down. Again, we're at square wave now and triangle. And these little, um, these little edges are getting finer and finer until finally we get back to zero where we have no sample rate reduction and we are back at the sawtooth waveform. So yeah, blue parameter, choosing the waveform and changing the sample rate reduction. And next up, the beige parameter right here, as it says there, it's a filter. And that's all it is. As usual for Teenage Engineering gear, this is a filter that can be either a low pass or a high pass filter. And it has a fixed resonance. So this filter will always have some amount of resonance unless you have it at zero and then you have no resonance, but also no filtering. But anyway, so at zero, this filter is completely open. You don't get any change in your sound. But if you turn it to the right, it will turn into a high pass filter. It will boost the low frequencies first because of that resonance that is now at the low frequencies. And slowly we are filtering out these low frequencies. until we are flatlining. So now the filter is completely closed. Uh, and yeah, we don't hear any frequencies. And now above 50, it will turn into a low pass filter. So we are slowly opening the low pass filter, getting more and more high frequencies. until we're at zero and the filter is completely open again. And our next parameter is the gray parameter. And this one has two functions, depending on if you go counterclockwise of 49, which is the neutral position like this, or clockwise from 49 like this. And in order to understand what's going on with this parameter, let's have a look at the Korg mini log. Most of you probably know what the Korg mini log is. It's an affordable analog synthesizer and to easily explain what's going on with the parameter on the OP1, I think this is a good opportunity to whip it out. First of all, let's initialize this patch right here. 
press right and it's initialized. And then I'm going to select a square wave right here. Square wave right here. And I'm gonna select a square wave on the OP1. And now all this gray knob is doing, it is changing the pulse width of our oscillator right here, which is the same thing as what I can do with the shape knob on the mini log. And if I turn this counterclockwise, until at the end you basically just hear a little click and a lot of the sound gets drained. Just like this. And now let's have a look what happens when we turn the gray knob clockwise from 49. As you can see, it still squishes the waveform, but this time, instead of at the end just adding a flat line, it adds more of the same waveform at the end of it. And this has the effect of introducing more overtones and giving us more high frequencies while still keeping the same bass frequency of our note. But again, let's check out how this works by having a look at the Korg mini log. First of all, let's start again with an initialized patch just so nothing goes wrong. And I'm gonna start this one with a, let's say a triangle wave. Let's set up a triangle wave on the OP1. All right. So we've got triangle and triangle. And now what I think is happening on the OP1 when I turn this knob clockwise. So we are getting more higher frequencies, but our base frequency or our fundamental is still staying the same. And I think what's happening there is that there is an oscillator sync happening. And Again, let's look at the mini log in order to figure out what that means. So right now I have only one oscillator activated right here. So we are only getting the fundamental frequency right now. But if I turn on a second oscillator right here, I will also turn that to the triangle waveform and I will turn off my first oscillator. So right now, these two oscillators are not synced. That means if I have them both on and change the pitch of one of them, we'll get detuning happening. And yeah, one of them is clearly out of tune. Now, if I turn on oscillator sync right here, that means that this second oscillator right here will be re-triggered. So its waveform will be re-triggered at the zero crossing point each time the first oscillator finishes a complete cycle. And that has the effect that, yes, I will hear some higher frequencies within my signal if I turn up the pitch of my second oscillator, but still I have the fundamental frequency of my original signal. So there's no real out of tuneness happening. So let's try this out first, sync off. Now sync on. As you can hear, even if I turn VCO2 off and back on, we are still in tune, although I have detuned this oscillator to be deliberately out of tune. And this is what oscillator sync is doing. It's forcing the second oscillator to be in tune with the first one, but because the waveform of the second one is off, 
because being out of pitch means that it's either going faster or slower. It gives us more frequencies, more harmonics that give us a richer audio signal. So now that the second oscillator is synced to the first oscillator, I can even play a note and at the same time play with the pitch of the second oscillator and it still doesn't change my pitch, it will only change the timbre or the sound of my sound. <laughs> So we're only changing the harmonics, we aren't really changing the pitch of our note. Now, what I think is happening in the OP1 right here is that actually the leading oscillator is not audible. So all we are hearing when turning the gray knob clockwise is the second oscillator actually, the follower oscillator. So I've turned the first oscillator off on the mini log and now let's hear what happens if I change the pitch while playing a note. And you can also see it in the oscilloscope what's happening. Now let's check if this sounds similar on the OP1. So we've got the same triangle waveform. Actually, let's do that with the shift button and turning in order to get a smoother signal. And as you can hear, I only need to sweep through quite a narrow region to get a similar effect. So on the mini log, I would basically have to go through different octaves and then sweep the pitch to get this wide range. Let's try this out again. And as you can hear, it does sound different on both devices. But I think that comes down to these being inherently different, one being digital and the other being analog. I am, let's say, 80% sure that uh, this is doing an oscillator sync uh, while only having the following oscillator active. Because as you can hear, if I turned my leading oscillator on here, as opposed to this, which sounds quite similar to what the OP1 is doing right now. We hear a lot more of our fundamental note, so a lot more of the low frequencies than we do here. So that's what leads me to believe that we are only hearing the following oscillator or the follower oscillator. And finally to our last parameter, the red knob right here is the chorus parameter. And this one is different from the other three because when you're at zero, you can't turn it further counterclockwise and same when you're at 99, you can't turn it further clockwise. Zero is the neutral position and this means of course that there is no chorus applied. And as you turn the red knob clockwise, you are not increasing the depth of the chorus, but rather only the speed of the modulation, I believe. So this is very slow modulation. As you can see, this line is going through the screen very slowly. And if I turn it up, the modulation is happening much faster. Now with this chorus, I am not exactly sure if it's a classical chorus as you would find on other effects units or in other DAWs. To my ears, it sounds somehow different and I would guess they are introducing some trickery into the process of creating the waveform rather than taking the waveform and as it is done in a classical chorus, 
copying the audio signal and then modulating one of them. I think there's some trickery introduced in the creation of the signal in the first place, but I'm not sure if you know any better, let me know down in the comments. But what I can say is that I'm not really a fan of this chorus because it sucks a lot of the energy out of my original signal. So this is what it sounds like without the chorus. Quite a rich signal and loud. And if I turn the chorus up, a lot of this richness and the edge gets lost. And moreover, say I turn this chorus to be a little bit slower. Okay, not quite as slow, a little bit faster. As you can hear, at this point, the signal almost cancelled itself out, which I think is not ideal for a chorus. I think the modulation depth should be so far that you create more interest and a wider sound palette. But in this case, it's just too extreme, the cancelling out of the signals. That's why I think this chorus is not ideal. Doesn't mean it can't be used at all, but I think it could be fine-tuned a little bit. And another interesting thing about this chorus is that the chorus resets or the modulation resets every time you play a note. So if I turn it to be relatively slow like this. And if I play the note again, it will restart the same way. So it resets every time you play a note on that specific note. So that's why I usually take it easy on the chorus or turn it off completely. It's just too strong of an effect in my opinion. But who knows, it might work for you. Let's turn it off for now. And as always, modulation makes any synthesizer more interesting. So let's have a look at what we could sign the LFOs to. Right now it's assigned to the phase parameter, which is the gray one, as you may remember. So we've got kind of a pulse with modulation going on. versus with no modulation. Makes for a lot more of a powerful sound and let's see what else we can modulate. Maybe the waveform. And as you might remember, the waveform also changes the sample rate reduction. So if we go into a territory where there is sample rate reduction, yeah, also interesting. And of course, you can always modulate a filter if you want to. I would recommend the element LFO for that and have the source my envelope. Turn it to affect the filter and actually create a more interesting envelope curve. And let's set the filter to be low pass. As always, experiment around as you like. And that's already it for this deep dive into the OP1's Dr. Synth engine. If you want to learn more about the OP1, about the OPZ or music making in general, feel free to contact me for private online lessons, link down in the description. Other than that, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, I would appreciate a like, a comment down below, subscribe to the channel and ring the bell so you don't miss the next video. I hope to see you in the next one. Peace.
and thank you for watching.